Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryan Suda. I'm one of the senior investment managers here at Sharewise, and we're here this morning with Martin Dillon. Now, Martin's been kind enough to lend us his time and expertise uh, as he's the CEO of TrueStream Group. So, Martin, just to kick things off, mate, for those who are not familiar with the company, can you introduce us to TrueScreen and give us a brief history regarding the company and what it does? Yep, TrueScreen um, was recapitalised in 2013. Um, we manufacture and sell a device for the screening of cervical cancer. Um, in fact, if you can see it on screen, it's just that this is the handheld device that we use for screening for cervical cancer. Um, and it has with it a disposable single-use sensor, which gives us a repeat income because it's a consumable. So yeah. we sell the device and we sell the consumable. The other part of the, the revenue chain for that is that Every woman should be screened every three years so that we have not just a, a repeat revenue on the consumable, but repeat customers. Um, and we target um, markets in low and middle income countries who don't have an existing screening infrastructure in place um, or an existing nationwide screening program. Um, cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women globally. There's about 600,000 women a year dying from it, and 90% of those deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. So that's, again, why we target those countries. Basically, it's a story of we'll go where the opposition is. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Now, so obviously, you know, TrueScreen has been you know, significantly impacted by AI and its impact on medical devices. How does TrueScreen plan to leverage AI to further enhance the early cancer detection capabilities and accuracy? Yeah. We have... The TrueScreen device uses an AI-driven algorithm, which is then frozen in time. Yeah. So that algorithm updates have to be run through the medical device regulators. It's not a constantly changing algorithm. Okay. Because the, the regulatory framework and the clinical trial work around that would be hideously expensive. Yeah. Uh, but we run at about low 80s to mid 80 percent sensitivity and high 70s in specificity um, and we're an objective device with a very reliable positive predictive value and a very reliable negative predictive value unlike a lot of other subjective screening methods out there um, navigating the ai landscape is as you say it's it's complicated and difficult and and our our frozen point of time approach to the algorithm is the way of dealing with that um, and also to deal with patient confidentiality, data protection, because it's different in every market in which we deal. So by having a consistent approach that is suitable for nearly all markets, but not yes. all markets, um, is the best way for us to navigate that tricky pathway. And, and it's becoming increasingly tricky. Um, just in the same way that, you know, you might look at global security becoming more fragmented now as, as Russia and China and the US and other players in the Middle East um, move away from, a, from what had been the norm over the last 20 years. So medical device regulations are moving away a bit. So, you know, our basic, our basic and core um, regulatory approval is the CE mark. And we comply with the medical device regulation in um, in Europe and the transition, the MDD to MDR transition. We have to work through that. But we're also ISO 13485. But previously, having CE would, would make it an easier entry into a lot of markets. But as economies grow and people become more independent, you know, the NMPA in China, the SFDA in Saudi Arabia, whether it's Indonesia, Vietnam, Mexico with code for priests. Everyone has now a, a slightly more independent approach to medical device regulation and different requirements. So again, it's something to navigate. So having this frozen point in time algorithm and then the clinical trials that support that is the best way for us to navigate that um, with the resources that we have available at this time. Okay. 
Now, just touching on what you previously just said, with the clinical trials, can you tell us more about what's going on uh, in that front? Okay, so we've we've had 20 years of clinical trials. Um, and with the current version of the device, uh, going through my head, eight years of clinical trials. Okay. Um, over 50,000 women. Um, and the device through technological improvements and algorithm improvements has become um, recognised as a safe, objective, reliable device for the screening of cervical cancer. And this includes clinical trials, for example, a 15,000 patient trial completed recently in China um, by the Chinese Ops and Gynae Association that, um, that will be published um, in a major Western journal um, within the next 12 months includes a recently released trial from Saudi Arabia, whose conclusion was that we were um, a first choice uh, product for use in national screening programs or screening programs where there's not an existing infrastructure for um, cervical cancer screening. So we're, and particularly in low resource economies. Um, and then that's supported by years and years of clinical trials. And that includes too the fact we've, been used on over a million women to date and not one adverse event reported. Okay, so obviously focusing on the notion that you guys are very much um, targeting, you know, the low to middle income areas, being listed on the Australian New Zealand Stock Exchange, what are true screening strategies for expanding their market reach beyond where you're currently situated in the market? Okay, so our, our single biggest market at the moment is China. Okay. And, and that will remain our biggest market. But to expand our support for China, um, our next two largest targets would be Vietnam and Mexico. And then we have, and through Vietnam, flowing down into what would be the ASEAN countries. So in the next four weeks, I will sign an agreement with a distributor for Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. We also are expanding into Africa, particularly what you might call Central Africa and East Africa, um, where we started with Zimbabwe, where we're the screening mode of choice for um, for the Ministry of Health there, doing doing cervical cancer screening in provinces such as Masvingo Province, and working with their National AIDS Council as well for women who suffer from AIDS who have a high incidence of cervical cancer and a high mortality from cervical cancer. Another expansion market we're going into is, of course, the Middle East where we're into Saudi Arabia, but then into Eastern Europe where we've got inroads into Poland and then we'll flow out from that. And then if we go further up into Central Asia, we will, we're in advanced discussions now with the government of Uzbekistan um, to commence a pilot program for validation as a screening method of choice for the Uzbekistan Ministry of Health. Um, and of course, we have a distributor already in Russia who wants to, who is authorised to distribute into the surrounding Central Asian republics of Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Belarus and Armenia. So we, we have an expansion plan and they are, they are regional plans. Um, and of those, you can break them into um, South and Southeast Asia, um, Central and Eastern Africa, Central America, although Mexico technically is North America, but we'll call that Central America, um, and Eastern and Central Europe. Okay, now when it comes to the notion of actually getting the product um, you know, to the stage where it can be used on a patient and how it's actually being sold, do you do this for remaining distribution agreements? Or is there situations or areas where you have people on brand? Yeah, no, the vast, the vast majority of relationships are distributor relationships. The distributors have the existing relationships with the key opinion leaders in the country, with the regulatory authorities in the country, with the Ministry of Health in the country. Um, and so we rely upon them. TrueScreen's model is to be expert managers of other people's expertise. Okay. So we keep a very lean head office team yeah. of, of eight people, um, six of those employed, two contractors, and then we use that to manage distributors and medical experts across the globe. 
We do, we will do, for example, in Uzbekistan, that will be a director government model. Because okay. that's the choice of the Uzbek government. Um, and in Zimbabwe, it's a direct commercial relationship with the Ministry of Health, but we use a third party to provide the logistical support we need and to and to act as our intermediary with the Ministry of Health. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for those examples there. Now, regarding your pre-existing partnerships and collaborations you've just spoken about, um, especially with you know other institutions, healthcare providers, and other tech companies, how are these contributing to True Screen's uh, you know business goals and business growth? Um, some of the the key supporting groups, definitely World Health Organization, um, who have included True Screen in their list of technologies that are pertinent for the screening of cervical cancer, and when. When countries such as Uzbekistan want to do a third party check with us, then the World Health Organization will back us up. It includes um, UNITAID, the United Nations Institute for the Treatment of AIDS, um, did the original, uh, original funding for our program in Zimbabwe for the first program, um, for the National AIDS Council in Zimbabwe. Uh, in China, for example, it's the Chinese Obstetrics and Gynecology Association and the Chinese Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, who both include TrueScreen in their guidelines for the treatment of cervical cancer. In Vietnam, it's it's the government, the Ministry of Health via the National Technical List, which includes TrueScreen as, um, as a screening method of choice for Vietnamese cervical cancer screening. In Mexico, it's Cofapris, um, which includes us as the device for use in the public health system as well as the private health system. Um, and then you flow on then, for example, into Saudi Arabia, where we're included in um, in private health insurance reimbursement. Uh, so there's, in every country, it's slightly different. And in every yeah. country, there are key organisations. But it's, it's nice to be picked up by certain foundations. And including, for example, we had a recent inquiry from the Baylor Foundation Baylor is one of the biggest medical schools in the United States based in Houston, Texas. They have a group of foundations they've set up in Africa um, and they have asked us about the logistics and the pricing of true screen for use in Eswatini, which is Swaziland. Now, if that goes ahead, then that's validation then for Baylor's work in the adjoining countries of Rwanda, Uganda and Tanzania. So, And then that ties in with our work in Zimbabwe, early work we're doing in Kenya, and then supporting work we'd like to do in Nigeria and Rwanda. So you can see that there's a tie-in between who looks at us and who can take us up yeah. and what might be small markets and then the large market opportunities that surround that. Okay, so with that in mind, other than you know your plans for geographical uh, expansion, what are some of the key strategies being used to drive revenue growth um, and overall just achieving profitability? Okay, so the key to driving re revenue growth is the placement of TrueScreen's devices into medium and large hospitals, private and public, and private and public health clinics, and then programs. And it's then once you've got the device in, it's the training and um, the training and customization of the service to increase the use of the disposable, so what we call a single-use sensor or a SUS, yep. um, so that we, when you first start out, start out in a hospital, you might only get you know, 20 devices a month, 20 SUS a month, sorry, per device. It's growing that so it grows to over 100. With a target, for example, in China, our target average is 290 SUS per month per device. Yep. Um, we currently sit at 126. 12 months ago, we were at 85. So yeah. we're, we're growing that at a at a growth rate of about, I think 42% was the year-on-year -year growth rate in that over the past 12 months. If we keep that again, we will be at around 180 to 190 um, by the end of this 12 months. Um, so we just want to keep pushing towards that figure. Um, and in other countries, we need to pick that up as well. In, in Zimbabwe, for example, 14,000 women are screened using, you know, a small number of devices because that's a high-use program. 
Yeah. You would hope that, for example, Uzbekistan would model that, um, that Vietnam would model that, and that in the public health system in um, in Mexico, we could model that as well. Okay. Okay. Now, obviously, you know, it sounds like things are tracking in a fairly strong uh, direction. How does True Strength plan to maintain strong investor confidence and attract additional capital to support its further growth? Uh, at our um, annual shareholders meeting held last week in Auckland, um, I set out in the presentation a series of objectives. Uh, they're not forecasts, they're objectives. But I set them out and I'll, re I'll report against those over time. And they include um, the growth and installation base of devices, um, the uptake in certain markets and in programs that we're, we're tendering for or negotiating to be part of. Um, and they, that includes, for example, Mexico City, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, the ASEAN countries, Poland, um, Kazakhstan, etc. cetera. And I, and I will report against those. Um, that should give the market confidence that we're not just wishing to grow. Yeah. We have a strategy for growth and I've laid that strategy out. Now, I might not achieve all of those objectives, but I will report against them. And if, if China gets to 50 to 70% of where I want to get to and a couple of the other apples land in the right place when they come out of the tree, then we'll meet all our targets for cash flow positivity, which is the key objective of the company. The key objective of the company is to be cash flow positive month to month within the next seven months. Okay. Now, just to pivot here, how does TrueScreen address concerns related to data privacy and security when handling sensitive patient data essentially across the globe? Okay. TrueScreen's device doesn't send patient data to the cloud. We are we are risk averse in that matter. Yeah. Uh, true screens, the true screen device can be worked into um, a hospital's patient administration system um, and, and talk to that. But in its simplest form, the device will give a abnormal or normal answer. Um, it will hold that data inside the device, but that data will be blinded and encrypted. Um, yeah. And then when the device gets returned for service, we can remove the SD card and delete that data. There is no way for an external person to get that data without breaking the device. And then they would also need to de-encrypt it. Um, when we work with a hospital administration system or a, or a, or a tablet or a mobile phone, um, or a laptop or a PC, that information can be stored on that, but that is then the information that's held by the hospital and their privacy systems. But there is no leaking of data to any other user other than the hospital and the program or internal to the device. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that clarification on that front. Just got a couple more. Uh, to lead us with for the day. Now, realistically, how does TrueScreen address ethical considerations related to the use of AI in healthcare, um, essentially such as, you know, bias and fairness? Yeah, um, it's it's what I said right up the front. Yeah. The algorithm was AI enabled. Um, any changes to the algorithm, any improvements will first have to be clinically tested and scientifically tested. And as the device stands right now, the algorithm is a frozen point in time. So our address to AI is that we will use it and then freeze the benefits of that use so that we don't have a constantly varying device, nor do we have, nor do we have AI on any of our computers in, the, in our um, network, so none in the office, none on anyone's laptops, so that if people want to use, you know, chat GPT, I mean, these are two different conversations. One is about the ethics of patient data and, and clinical trials and how relevant they are if, if your device and your algorithms are changing, which, as I said, we deal with that by freezing it. The other one is to keep, to keep AI out of drilling through our intellectual property and using that 
to look to teach itself about how to teach other people what to do. We won't allow that in our system. We keep any time AI is used, it's used separate to any of our systems. Oh, brilliant. Thank you for that clarification there, Martin. We've just got one more here to lead us off with for the morning. Now, what is True Strength's vision for its contribution uh, to global health outcomes, you know, particularly in underserved regions? But, sorry, can you repeat that? I... What is True Strength's vision for its contribution to global health outcomes, particularly in underserved regions? Yeah. That's the whole reason we exist. This technology was, was first um, dreamt dreamt of by um, Malcolm Coppelson, who wrote one of the foundation textbooks on cervical cancer, and another gynecologist or another scientist, Bevan Reed. Um, and it was purely about an objective device that takes away the subjective reliance on human um, interpretation of shapes and colour. So, for example, pap smear, colposcopy, et cetera, they're all subjective. True screen's objective. The, the device is always expert. The device can never be used other than when it's at its peak operating performance. It just won't start. It self-checks. We target markets that are underserved in cervical cancer screening that can't afford to put in place a national um, setup of pathology labs and colposcopy referral centres, et cetera. That's, that's what we're best at. As I said, there are over 600,000 women a year dying from cervical cancer. Mortality rate is highest in the countries we go into. So I would say that our whole raison d'etre, our reason for existence, is to serve those countries that most need us, where most deaths occur. Not where most wealth is, but where most death occurs. Okay. Well, Martin, thank you very much for your time and expertise this morning. Before we wrap things up, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? No, I, I think that's pretty good. I think if anyone wants to go on our web, website and go to announcements and look at the latest announcement, which was the um, the release of the presentation at the annual shareholder meeting, um, if they go through that, they'll see what, as again, it's not forecasting, it's their objectives, but I've laid out our strategy for growth um, in that document, and I will report on those from time to time. Um, and I have a series of of announcements that will be made as we tick off those objectives. All right, well, brilliant. Thank you very much for your time this morning, uh, Martin, and thank you very much for your time this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Thanks very much, Ryan. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen.